All right, good morning. Hey, everybody, I'm here with Dr. Russell, and uh, we're going to talk about the team rubric. Dr. Russell worked as a team evaluator. He was evaluating, you know, teachers in the field with the rubric, so he knows it inside and out. And he's got uh, some uh, tips and, and kind of uh, focuses for you as you look at the team rubric and prepare to be a, a good teacher. So you want me to just go ahead and take off here, uh, yeah. Brian? But feel free also to ask me like uh, questions that you want specifically answered. So let me just okay. start with uh, the uh, the team rubric is designed to be looked at holistically. And what I mean by that is rather than necessarily looking at uh, looking at, at parts or just pieces of it, it's it's meant to be a um, a holistic uh, instrument. And uh, you also have to look at it from the standpoint of the three domains. So we, uh, in the uh, general educator rubric, which is what um, most uh, classroom teachers are gonna be evaluated on, you have to look at it from uh, the three domains, which is uh, planning, uh, instruction, and environment. And in those, when you look at the number of indicators, that tells you, that gives you kind of a relative importance of uh, each of the domains. So uh, planning has uh, three indicators, environment has four, and then uh, instruction has um, 12. So um, when we think about just, uh, just the significance of uh, the, just the number of indicators alone, we know that most of our energy, most of our time needs to be focused on, uh, on the instruction. But as I started, it's holistic. And so uh, if we're talking holistic, then that, that tells me that uh, I have to, if, if, if my planning is really good, then that's going to also impact my environment uh, and help make my environment better, as well as uh, I have the planning in place, and it's going to impact the instruction. So i say that because uh, I think that's really important to keep uh, in mind. And that is also sometimes what make, can make the, uh, the rubric feel like it's, it's overwhelming, because if you start looking at uh, all of those uh, indicators all 19 indicators then it can feel like wow this is this is a, a lot and yeah. it and it is it is a lot but uh, as we we really want to narrow when we're talking about uh teaching and we're talking about uh the lesson plans we normally want to narrow in on the instructional rubric and so again uh all of the indicators uh, on the rubric are meant to be thought of holistically. So I'm considering everything there and looking at uh, how they interconnect. So if, um, if I'm talking about um, um, uh, questioning, then that's connected to my uh, standards and objectives, right? So the things that the questions that I write um, are going to be are going to be tied directly to my standards and objectives. Um, there, it is going to make a difference in how uh, I present my instructional content. Again, those things uh, fit together. But I, I wanted to uh, to zero in on some of the things that that I think that um, novice teachers, first year teachers, as well as uh, the student teachers. Uh, that I've worked with, I uh, see them sometimes struggle with. Uh, and the areas that I think that you may want to really kind of zero in on before moving on to uh, um, uh, some of the other indicators. And uh, let me just identify those for you uh, quickly. So uh, first of all, because uh, that instruction is what we do, Instruction is what we deliver, uh, and then our our students 
that's what they're coming to, uh, part of what they're coming to us for, but uh, a big part of in terms of what the job is. Um, I'm going to, that's where I'm going to uh, focus my, my time and attention. And that's where you're going to find what we call the, the uh, significant four uh, indicators. It doesn't mean that, um, that they are more significant than the others. It's just that th these are significant because people often struggle with them and they may not realize that the importance, they may jump to some things like thinking um, and problem solving. And uh, it's better, I think, to zero in on these four as you are initially planning and just, and just really looking at what the rubric is saying about them. So first is standards and objectives. And as simple as that sounds, uh, a lot of times uh, people will struggle with that. And when you look at what the indicator is calling for, uh, things like uh, that are the learning um, objectives uh, communicated? Um, are, um, are they connected to uh, the state standards and referenced throughout the lesson? Well, what does that look like? Uh, at one time, people were saying, hey, all you had to do is have it on the board, or all you have to do is say it. But notice the, the active word here, communicated. And uh, this is when you're talking at just at, 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 uh, at meeting expectations. Uh, you have to communicate the, what's con and connect it to those state standards. And communicate to me has said something different. It means that there's explanation that uh, you're not just saying it, but that you are helping the students make these connections that are that you're discussing here. And uh, another aspect of it is uh, that the expectations are clear. So we've gone through a phase where uh, I see a lot of times things are written as uh, I can statements. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can statements are okay. And it's okay to have those listed there. But I always say also the teacher should list uh, out have them in, in, in form that makes that is certain to make clear the high expectations that you have for your students and the clear expectations for where students are going to uh, end up. So you want to uh, you want to make certain that um, that your students that you and the students know what the end is with this lesson and why that's important is. It's going to impact your feedback. It is going to impact how you motivate students. You can't give the clarity and feedback uh, the, with the students that is um, evidence driven if you don't know where you're driving the ship to. Okay, so that's, that is really, really critical as you are setting those. And no. then, uh, yes. You don't you don't know the purpose the kids aren't going to know the purpose that's and right the purpose has to be the objective right and so I, that is I, correct you know when somebody's writing a paper if they don't know their purpose the paper is usually bad and it's the same with a lesson right like if you don't write the the lesson how can it be a good lesson and when you do lesson planning when you're writing when you're coming up with standards objectives you now we're thinking here we're you you typically at uh lower grades at primary grades you may be looking at, you know, 25, uh, 30 minute lesson mm -hmm. um, to uh, the high schools, then you're looking at um, a 90 minute lesson. Um, but so you have to write th with the, your objectives, which are under those standards, you've got to write those objectives to reflect what you are actually teaching. So. You may, when you list the standard on your, uh, on your lesson plan, um, you probably are only teaching a portion of it. And I always tell people, highlight or make clear what portion of that standard you're teaching. Because standards are, um, they're not goals, but standards are still much broader than the instructional objectives that you're using and normally require um, multiple lessons to fully get get through them so 
that would be uh, that would be something that I would that I would encourage you to to think about as you're working on this this indicator in particular. All right, the second one that I uh, that I want to point out that a lot of people don't think is um, uh, that critical, or they don't know that gosh that, that some young uh, new teachers struggle with this is uh, lesson structure and pacing. And uh, again, when you look at the indicator, the indicators are not in the language of the indicator is nothing that's really fancy or. Uh, anything like that, but there's some really important words that I think you need to zero in on as you're thinking about this. Um, so you'll see over on uh, um, the at level five where um, Dr. Sohn's cursor is, the lesson starts promptly and you will see to get to meet expectations. Also, the lesson has to prompt to start promptly. And then underneath that is the, the structure, the lesson structure is coherent with a beginning, middle, and end. Both level three and uh, level five require that. And then when you get moved, you'll see in the next one is pacing is appropriate and sometimes provides opportunities for students who progress at different learning rates. That's meeting expectations. Um, and then if you really want to reach the, the top, if you want to be um, really engaging for the students, then the lesson includes time for reflection. Pacing is, is brisk and provides many opportunities for individual students who progress at different learning rates. So the thing about this indicator is, is it really shows the difference, what the difference is between a, 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 a meeting expectations and being above expectations on this rubric. And if you just look there, you can see it pretty quick, pretty quickly. When we got into where there was a difference between meets expectations and above expectations on that indicator, what you see is it's about what the students are doing. Hmm. So often when I look at lesson plans and I look in, at the lesson structure um, and pacing, the teacher writes the lesson plans for themselves. Now you are gonna do that. I mean, that's who it's for, it's for you or the substitute that may come in, but they do not, they write about what they are going to do. They, every, all the language is um, this is what the this is what the teacher is doing and they don't tell as much about what the students are doing and so one of the things that that I have teach uh, students to do is to write their um, to write to have two parallel uh, mm -hmm. columns and so one has the activity, the name, and then the next one will be what the teacher is going to say and do. And then the other has um, what the student is doing at the time. And so if you're writing a lesson plan and you find that you're, you're, all you're writing about your students is they are listening and taking notes or something to that degree, if you, if you look at your lesson plan and they're doing that for um, a significant amount of time, you know, for long periods of time, then probably you, you, you've got an issue in terms of, uh, of how you're engaging your students. And so what I really want to know, yes, I want to know the activity and I want to know that you're giving directions and I want to hear your questions I want to hear those things, and that's very, very important, especially the questioning, as we'll get to next. But the, the, the big thing that I want to know is what are students going to be doing? What should I see and hear students doing in this lesson? And so all the indicators are done with that, uh, with that in mind. Um, and then uh, a part of all of this, again, I talk about how the, the rubrics 
um, connect. So instruction and planning. Notice in here uh, as a part of structure and pacing, routines for uh, distributing materials are seamless. In the in meeting expectation, expectations, it says efficient. I'm not really sure the difference between efficient and seamless are, but I think what, what's more important to take away from that is if you're well planned, you're not going to be, um, you're not going to be over in the weeds uh, just hunting for a golf ball. Uh, and what I, what I mean by that is it, it's, if you have, if your students sit idle where you are, you have, you have to turn your back or something else takes your attention where you're having to hunt for something or gather something, it takes about, um, and this is uh, research that's done out of the University of Tennessee several years ago, it takes about two seconds for the first student to begin to move off task, for you to begin to lose them. And uh, it, 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 it does not take long before you, you've got uh, students are off, they will occupy their own time if you are not structured and give them th th those clear directions. Uh, so that's, that's wow. the importance like of that. One. Huh? Yeah. All right, um, Brian, go ahead and move down. I think um, uh, questioning will uh, be coming up next. And this is a, uh, this is a, this is a really, really big one. I think in terms of engaging the students um, and just um, an area to focus on and to, to really plan, you know, with, 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 with this instruction, with um, making sure that you ask the right, uh, that you're asking the questions that you uh, want, the uh, uh, pacing, for example, um, I, I tell I always encourage uh, my teachers as well as um, the student teachers use time stamps use use time uh, for how the, the when you want it to end and if you know that the lesson is starting at nine o'clock I always say use use literal like nine nine o five get build your time in uh, to your lesson plan have a column where it, uh, it, it, you, uh, you show that and, um, and, and pace out with that, with the time. It's the same thing in the same way, plan your questions. So plan the ver the, uh, varied questions that you're going to ask. Um, one of the things that, uh, you, you will, you will often hear people talk about, um, uh, the higher order questions, you've got to get a higher order questions. And what is really, what's really after here is what we want is students thinking, think students thinking and, uh, and doing, and it talks about high quality. Teacher questions are varied and high quality providing for some, but not all question types is where is meeting expectations. So we there, it means that yes, uh, you're, you're going to have uh, questions that are, that get at just knowledge and comprehension. In other words, it is, they are processing maybe uh, what you have said, they're processing what you have read in science. Um, it may be the basic directions for and safety guidelines uh, that, that if you're getting ready to do an experiment, that's important. You want to be sure they've got that knowledge and, and that they comprehend those things. But at the same time, you want to uh, uh, push students into application, analysis, synthesis or creation and uh, evaluation. So um, we, uh, we, want, we want them to uh, synthesize information uh, and that be and that occurs in dialogue. Uh, so where that is why you want to build in time for students to dialogue uh, with one another, um, and you present prompts, question prompts uh, for them to uh, have that dialogue. 
but you want to ask a ver a variety of questions that uh, that are and 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 you uh, have gotten this information from or you will in, in this program. Uh, so plumes, um, excuse me, Bloom's taxonomy, uh, and then also you will hear about Webb's uh, depth of knowledge, and so all of those. Are, um, are, are certainly great guidelines on how you go about asking uh, questions. But really, you want to plan your questions, plan that varied, uh, the, 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 the varied levels. And then um, the other thing that we, are, we want to see is students having to tell why. Why uh, they answer a question the way they do. And so a lot of times you will hear people talk about text-based evidence. Um, so that's one, that's one way uh, that it will be based on what, what has been read. Um, but it can also be evidence based on what they did. So in mathematics, for example, uh, the, it may be more along the, the, the reason the evidence may be based on the uh, sit, uh, the uh, um, syntax or other things like that that they present. Um, and then we also want them to be able to cite evidence from like experiments. Uh, so actual activities that they're engaged in where they're having to justify uh, their answer with evidence. And, um, and then again, questions should be at a, at a moderate uh, frequency or you want a high frequency of questions um, and uh, they should be consistently sequenced again remember what I, I started out talking about uh, as I talked about the uh, standards and objectives I said you got to know where you're going you got to know that before uh, even it's going to impact the questions you uh, you ask it impacts uh, other aspects of this lesson and here it is um, uh, your questions are consistent with the uh, goals and objectives that are being taught. And the questions requ uh, regularly require active responses. And so what does that mean? Um, that, that means that you are, that, that one, you're not just asking students to, um, everything is not, necessarily kind of like a canned um, uh, presentation, but it may actually require students to uh, do something with the text. Um, they, they, you can uh, have the, um, uh, just their engagement uh, with the uh, information. The, also it can be those things like choral responses and uh, where students are giving you the thumbs up, the, uh, um, those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, so, you know, like thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, fist of five, you know, uh, all five up means you're fully in, but there's ways for you to, uh, there's ways for you to get um, uh, the pulse of your students. And that is, that is examples then, that's connecting on, um, how you're evaluating or you're assessing students, right? So the questions become a part of your uh, informal assessments. Another one that can really be a challenge for students is wait time. Do you, oh, yeah. we get in a tear a lot of times in, in teaching and two seconds can feel like you have stopped for five or six seconds. Um, but you really want to give students time to process. Remember what I said um, before, it's, well, I want to know what students are doing. I want to see students doing, and uh, I want to hear from them. Um, and that's why you see these things even at, at, at uh, level three. But when you move over into, uh, into uh, the level five rubric, it is all about. Uh, students uh, getting engaged. And so evidence of that is when you look down 
Uh, you see wait time is consistently provided. Why? Because we want to give them that processing time. And then the teacher calls on volunteers and non-volunteers uh, and a balance of students based on ability and sex. You're going to see that in both uh, meets expectations and uh, above. But then look at that next one. Students generate questions that lead to further inquiry and self-directing learning. So again, we're talking about this is students uh, uh, um, uh, demonstrating, students uh, getting it. And a lot of times people will miss that, that difference. So you want to be sure that you're, um, you're giving it the situation or, or uh, opportunity where students are able to uh, generate questions. And so how do you do that? Especially in a tight lesson. But the thing to always remember when once you go into dialogue, have an opportunity, give it a, a, a time where you start with, okay, well, what questions came out of your dialogue? What questions did came out of the time you that, that you had with, uh, in your small group or with your partner? And give a, a little bit of time for some of those questions to uh, to emerge, and they will have already they will already have their own evidence, and they will probably have attacked it. But every everyone in the class then also gets the opportunity to uh, to uh, um, understand, to one to see that thinking and hear it, and um, and to uh, to hear how they answered it, and then. Um, uh, questions regularly assess and advance student understanding. So if, um, if you stick at the knowledge level, if you have things where you're just uh, knowledge and comprehension, uh, and it's literal, what is provided in the text uh, as early as we talked about earlier, then you, that's one of the things I'm going to ask is how, how did this lesson advance uh, student understanding. What evidence do you have um, that um, you you advance the uh, the level of understanding of the students? Because it's really if you get if you get hung up on the uh, just the basics or the at the knowledge and comprehension level, and you haven't really done a good job of pre-assessing your students and 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 you really don't know them that well, it's really easy. For uh, you, for you to get stuck on the basics of the lesson, because of the lesson, because if if you do have some someone that is struggling with content or with the um, with the expectations, then on that, that lower end, it will dominate you. It can it can be where you will go, you will spend your time because you will feel like, oh, I've got to move this student, and you do, but this in the middle of the lesson is not the time to learn that. That's why we do pre-assessments. It's really, the, the, if you're not pre-assessing your students uh, and figuring out what, what they know, then um, you are not differentiating your instruction. There, you can't differentiate instruction um, just based on um, what you think uh, or feel. It has to be based on what you know about your students. And the way you know it is you, pre, you, you have pre-assessments that involve you assessing their prior knowledge and also the skill that the, 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 the knowledge and skill that is required in this lesson. I'm not saying the content, but I'm saying the knowledge and skill that is required in this lesson because if they already know the knowledge and skill, um, then uh, I'm, it's, I'm, I would question why the content, why, why, to, why should that student have to sit through um, a bunch of material that they already have the knowledge and skill to process and do. And so um, it's really, really important. And here's what we know about students. Here's what, here's what um, the, the research has, uh, has, has told us for um, some time now. And going all the way back to the um, uh, effective schools uh, research of the end of the 70s. Students that um, 
students who are put in a situation where they have to sit through a, a class where they already, uh, they, well, let's just take this group. Students who have sit through a class where they, they are not ready, they don't have the prerequisite knowledge, you haven't built that in, you just jump into the new uh, skill and knowledge and you teach content that is tied to that, what do those students feel? They feel frustration. They get frustrated because they don't have the prerequisite knowledge and skill to process, to deal with that. And so that's why it's really important that we identify those. On the other side, a student who already has it, they are, uh, they are advanced. You could lay this down and, I, and, I, and some of you may have had to take spelling tests uh, back when you were in elementary school. And you may remember those tests where you had to write, you may have had a teacher that had you to write every word five times each. Uh, and you did all of those uh, uh, crossword puzzles, doing the words backwards. Not sure how that helped you to spell it better. But you did all those kinds of things. Um, I don't know if some of you may have experienced something with that. Um, kids that already have it, already know it, they also experience frustration, just like the kids that don't have the prerequisite knowledge. And so frustration in a lesson is never good. Um, and I, I, I say that because it is, it's, it's important to be aware of your students. And when you're asking, when you're building these questions, you want to build them with the end in mind. Where are you taking the students? How are you advancing their understanding on what you are teaching? And, uh, and then as, uh, as we've already talked about in both of them, in both the meets expectations and then the above expectation, if, you, if, if this is a science class, if it is a um, history class especially, English, those kinds of things, and you're using text, um, you're using research in science, you want your students to use um, the um, uh, text-based evidence. Text should be involved in the majority of questions uh, when, they're, when it is a text-based um, content. So, that notice it doesn't say you always have to do that, right? If you're doing it, if you're if you're doing a hands-on experiment, if you're um, if you're doing building a, a electric circuit, or um, if you're um, doing something where you're making putty, or whatever, the uh, the observations are going to be enough. Um, so um, scroll down to uh, the bottom now, just uh, quickly. Uh, yeah, right. Right, right there, those are the problem solving and, and thinking. So, see if we can show both of those, Brian. So that, I just wanted to point out, so the, the two columns we're looking at there is problem solving and thinking. And questioning helps to build that. But I, I will tell you that when we think about thinking and problem solving, um, it's better to think of those over time, thinking over a lesson. <clears throat> and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these two because these two attend to be areas where, especially on the initially, you're not going to um, you're not going to, to to score above expectations in thinking and problem solving uh, starting out, and that's okay. Um, but you can these you can also get so hung up on trying to meet thinking and problem solving in one lesson that um, it can it it can mess you up. Where questioning kind of pulls in with both of these. And um, it, hey, the, um, question. yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's why I always say, rather than getting down and, and not that you don't want to look to see and think about the thinking that you're teaching, the types of thinking that you're teaching and uh, the problem solving that you're having your students do. But if you start first with just your questions, that is going to help you, uh, that's going to help you greatly. Uh, now let's go back up to feedback. Yeah. So um, again, this would be the fourth area that I, I think uh, is very um, 
worthwhile um, spending a little time on as you're planning your lessons. A lot of times we don't think about it, but we, this is probably the, maybe as, um, as important, maybe uh, more important even than uh, some of the other things that the teacher is doing during the, the course of the instruction. And often though, we fail to plan for this. In other words, we, we, we certainly intend to give feedback, but we don't plan to provide the feedback. And so I would, I would encourage you as you are uh, working through a, um, uh, your lesson plans and you are provide, if you're writing um, direct, your, what you're going to say, what you're expecting students to do in a section, one of the things that you include in your, in, in terms of what you're going to do, what I'm going to see you providing is feedback and plan some of that feedback based on what the students are doing and what the outcome of what they are doing uh, as you advance their understanding. So since you're advancing, what kind of feedback do you need to give to the students? And, and feedback can be whole class, it can be small group, and it can be individual. So think in terms of, of um, who, who the target audience is and what you are wanting to accomplish. What are you advancing uh, with this uh, feedback? So just looking at the difference between the, the uh, five and, uh, and or the uh, above expectations and meets expectations, um, notice that um, you get the word mostly um, in um, the meets expectations. Um, and then the difference is it's consistently. Uh, again, I always struggle sometimes with those uh, mostly's and consistently's and how the, the team rubric does that. But basically what I like, what I always uh, want people to take away from that is we want it to be academically focused, frequent, high quality and uh, reference expectations. The, 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 that is the above uh, or the above expectations level, but I think you've got to start there on this one. Um, and I'm not saying you've got to call out, okay, here, the, uh, the, the expectation by name, but, but as you are, um, as you're giving feedback, uh, being able to, what we often do is we will give our perspective. We'll give our perspective. Uh, and then there is a, another column uh, then another step in uh, this process of feedback, and that is, I think, the data, uh, data-based or evidence of uh, what you're saying, giving them in perspective. And then the next aspect of that is reflective. How can this, imp by knowing this, what can you do with this tomorrow? What can, how does this change uh, what you'll do in your lesson tomorrow? That kind of thing. That's for the, the teacher candidate. That just the, the thinking about um, feedback. That's how I'm, I address teacher candidates. And I think it's important that we address students in the same way. So yes, you want to give them perspective. And that may be, you really did a great job of wait time today. Uh, I, I, I noticed that uh, initially you, uh, you were only giving uh, a couple of seconds of uh, wait time, um, uh, in a, it were in a prior lesson, you only were, you were averaging more around a couple of seconds for wait time. Today, by the end of the lesson, you were wait, you were giving students uh, eight seconds or more. That's that that's that's feedback with evidence. And then um, I might ask a perspective: How does this? How will this affect? Um, uh, how does this affect you going forward in planning your lessons? How will you remember to do this? So you want to give students that, you, you want to give them specific evidence-supported feedback and then the opportunity to reflect on what they're taking away from that information. Um, so the, the feedback is really important with that in that area. Yes, sir. Wouldn't you say one of the big weaknesses 
with kind of what novice teachers will do is they think that their job is to be the expert rather than to turn the student into an expert. And so like you're saying, like you start out, hey, here's what you did right, here's what you did wrong. And then you stop. Yes, yes. The thing yes. is, if you did right, here's what you did wrong. Now, how will you use this information to work towards our goal? Yes, and it, it is really important that you know that, um, you know, just like the, the evaluator can't be out to turn the teacher into a mini me. Uh, it's the same with the mm -hmm. student. Students are going to learn differently and and they're going to have different strengths. And you you've mm -hmm. got to uh, you, you've got to come at it with with that understanding. So when you go through the whole flow there that I was just talking about, where you 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 give a perspective and you give the evidence. It, it also keeps you from kind of getting locked in on, uh, well, the, the, there's, there's just this one way to do this, but instead you're telling mm -hmm. what, what you see that's good. And maybe it may be an area that, uh, you know, you struggled a little bit with blank today. You struggled with, with wait time today, then yeah. giving the evidence for that. But the important piece is Brian, just what you just said, is giving the, the, the student the, uh, the opportunity to take what's being said there, what that feedback, and giving them an opportunity to reflect how do they, how do they um, uh, modify that and let them tell you. Sometimes there are things that, that, can, that can occur where you do have to get down and you have to just say, and you have to at least initially walk them through the steps for uh, you know, getting getting the correct content uh, to make sure there's not a not misinformation being uh, given. But uh, yes, absolutely, you're absolutely right in that. And um, the, the the one that you have highlighted there is uh, really a, a big. Uh, all of them are, the, and that's the thing. All the indicators are equal. And uh, you know the 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 look fors that you see here, and that's what these are. They're look fors. Um, feedback yeah. from students is regularly used to monitor and adjust instruction. Um, feedback from students. How are you gathering that? That's why I say you've got a plan for your feedback. And um, again, uh, uh, if if you want to be uh, above expectations. If you want to be that the, the teacher that is, uh, you know, someone that is teaching at the top of the game, then it, it's really important that you have it's it, that you focus in on what are the students going to be doing with all of this. So in in, in all of this, as we've talked about, where it ends up, it is the students doing something, and it's what you want to see students uh, doing that is is so so critical. Um, mm -hmm. So again, teachers engage students in giving specific and high quality feedback to one another. And that's why I talked about mm -hmm. dialogue and understanding the difference between dialogue and just talking or discussion. Okay. If there is dialogue going on, then students are, they're using, um, metaphors, similes, you're guiding them in uh, having, um, having discussions where they are actually given the opportunity to uh, synthesize the information and glean new learnings that maybe you haven't even thought of. That's, that's the beauty of, of it. They, they, can, they can take things to places you, you, might not, you may not go because their, their experiences um, are all different. As well, and so all of the all of those uh, experiences they and the the metacognition of that they have the ability to do all of our we're all different, and so there's an opportunity for That's new exciting. learning there. Yeah, it's really exciting when that happens, and and the thing that to I think to be a teacher and to be excited about learning and kids, you have to be able to uh, recognize that something that may initially seem wrong to you from a student mm -hmm. actually is right if you can get them to articulate it absolutely. right and then it can kind of surprise you yeah absolutely absolutely uh and you know the the 
the the thing about um, when it comes to the evaluations, here's the other thing that I, that I always uh, have encouraged with my, my teachers, um, as well as, as I said, the student teachers. It's, it's, this is not about a score. And I hate that it even, that we even use numbers. Um, in the Tiger uh, uh, version of this, which is used in about uh, 30 school districts across the state of Tennessee, they don't use numbers. Uh, they they, they hmm. use just the language of the rubric. And, and we've got, in, uh, I've worked with a pilot in Knox where it's um, uh, we, using the Tiger uh, rubric and it, is, and it is just the language as well. And what I mean by that is, uh, just like the feedback that we were talking about giving students rather than, than getting into, well, you, you scored a three on uh, feedback or you scored a four on feedback. Instead, it is like what I talked about, even in those, in those conferences, it is, here's, you did a really nice job with feedback in providing, uh, calling on volunteers and non-volunteers today. Um, and there is, it, it becomes about just, this, this, this rubric is only worth anything when it is helping you to grow as a teacher and for you to do just like what we're asking um, students to do here uh, in terms of the learning that is going on in the classroom where you are taking the experience, the knowledge that you gained about your own practice uh, when you delivered and it was assessed and then turn around and and apply that to your own practice to improve. And it means you're reflect your reflective practitioner who is always growing. And it's a learning, it is an absolute cycle. So the, uh, the first thing is you plan and that planning is done based on your knowledge of the students. And then the uh, next is you deliver the instruction and you collect evidence of how well you did, how well, how well students, uh, it, it helps students um, to grow their understanding. And then you collect that evidence, and then you move to the next part, the next action step is you, um, you look at what the evidence is telling you, and then you reflect on what does that mean for you as a practitioner? What does that mean to you as a, a teacher? Uh, what do you need to, where do you need to grow? What do you need to modify? Is there something that you take away that you can apply the next time you're in front of those students that will help you but do a better job? And, and um, every one of the indicators can be used that way. But um, those four are the ones that, that they, the, and the reason I zeroed in on those, all four of those have fingers that reach into others. When you start talking about feedback, connects to the to um, the standards um, and it also impacts on uh, questioning uh, the feedback and questioning that go hand in hand you can almost you can you can do that with each one of those that I that I presented just like questioning it's going to impact problem solving and thinking um, it is also yeah. going to certainly impact the feedback that you provide so any other yeah. things Brian you specifically Want to discuss? No, I, I think this is great. Um, yeah, I, I think a good challenge for uh, students of ours would be to try to see those connections between the different pieces. Like, how many indicators can you connect feedback to? How many indicators can you connect questioning to? Um, and that, that would be a good exercise to help them see how those four are really good things to focus on now um, as they're getting started, getting familiar with this. Yes, I would agree. All right, cool. Well, I'm going to stop the recording here.